All right. So welcome back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism live tonight. We have Morgan Artukina. We are here to talk about Zionism and Judaism. Um, and we'll also get into some discussion of, of genocide. And, um, you know, obviously, we did not expect that we would be having this conversation on such an eventful day. And, um, you know, maybe at the end, we can have a little bit of discussion of that. But it's not really what we came here, um, you know, specifically to talk about. This wasn't an emergency podcast on this front. It was um, to help provide more context for people thinking about this moment more broadly um, and, you know, dealing with helping, I guess, to demystify in some ways the relationship between Judaism and Zionism, um, which I feel like is always conflated uh, in this current moment in particular, but in the West very broadly and in the United States specifically, and of course, you know, in Israel as well. And um, so that was the the original intent, and we're going to stick with that. Uh, I should say that both myself and our guests are not at emergency protests that are going on tonight. And so I understand if people are at those, our full solidarity to you all. Um, and certainly our hearts are in, in Gaza tonight as we enter into this conversation. Um, so I'll introduce our guests. I'm very excited to have Morgan Artukina here. Um, I've known her for, I guess, since 2017. So um, going back What's that, six years now? So um, Morgan is an anti-Zionist Jewish transgender woman, a journalist, historian, and activist in Washington, D.C., who is deeply involved in the fights against war and racism. Her recent article, The Most Dangerous Convergence of Religious Nationalism in Israel and America, sorry, The Dangerous Convergence of Re Religious Nationalism in Israel and America, was published by Fellowship Magazine and Waging Nonviolence. So, Morgan, without further ado, uh, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and doing this. And even though this wasn't an emergency podcast for tonight, you did agree to do this on very short notice. I think I reached out to you on, I don't know, Saturday or Sunday. And <laughs> so I appreciate you, um, you know, prepping and, and coming on on such short notice with such a, you know, important things going on in our world right now. So one of the things I wanted to do tonight um, is I think folks need a bit of a of a primer or I don't know if you say that primer or primer, but either one on the relationship between Judaism and Zionism. And, you know, where does the Zionist project kind of emerge, the Zionist project of Israel? Um, you know, and obviously, that's a huge question. And, you know, I don't expect you to go into like full detail on all of it, but um, I would love for you to kind of help us contextualize that and um, understand it a little better. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess the first thing to really kind of make clear is that there's actually two Zionisms. Um, there's the Jewish Zionism, um, which is the, the kind of Jewish, bourgeois quest, you know, for, for basically a Jewish part in kind of the bourgeois nation building projects of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and that is one that is revolved around, you know, the idea of a, a national state for an ethnic minority kind of thing. Um, and that's a whole thing. And we can, we'll definitely get into that. But I just want to say that's one kind of Zionism. The other kind of force of Zionism is uh, Christian Zionism. And Christian Zionism, um, which is also called, I think it's called like pre-millenarian dispensationalism or something along those lines, is a very specifically Protestant attitude, an Anglo-Protestant attitude um, that basically sees uh, the return of Jews to the Holy Land as a precondition for the second coming of Christ. Uh, and there's all in this kind of like beginning of the end of time scenario there's a whole kind of like uh um like basically what is going to happen is that all the jews wind up having to go back to the holy land and then they 
basically either have to become Christians or will die horrible deaths and go to hell and stuff. So like not great things happening for the Jews in this scenario. But so suffice to say, there are two different reasons that people support this Zionist idea of um, a state for Jews and only Jews uh, in the land of Palestine. Uh, and that and, and those come from two different things. And they've kind of merged into this singular force such as such that today in the United States, Christian Zionism is by far the dominant one. To give you just a little, a, a little, just one example, there's one, just one of the Christian Zionist organizations, Christians United for Israel, has 10 million members, which is more than more members than there are Jews in the United States. So there's only about 7 million Jews or so in the U.S. So that, that kind of gives you just an idea. That's just one, you know, member, one, one thing. So just to give you an idea of kind of some of the forces that are behind this. Obviously, I think everybody already knows the deal with the Balfour Declaration, the British Empire, 1917, promises to give, uh, promises the Zionist movement, uh, which had some coherency by then, to give the Jews a national state in the Palestine mandate that they had just taken from the Ottoman Empire. Um, the That movement got its start uh, in Central Europe about 20 or so years earlier. Uh, and as I said, kind of arising from the same milieu where you had all these other empires that had lots of other ethnic minorities in that part of the world too, who were also pressing for national states, the Czechs, the Romanians, the Serbs, uh, the Poles, and so on. So, so in that context, Jews were kind of like, well, what about us, you know? Um, and I mean, Jews are a little interesting in that, like, we are kind of scattered all across Europe, you know what I mean? Like there are Jews in Germany and France and Britain, and also in the very heavily concentrated areas of like the Russian Pale of Settlement, Central Europe, and all of that kind of stuff too. Um, and the the it's the really intense anti-Semitism that comes about as a result of these nation building projects, um, you know, contributes to the pogroms, contributes to the violence, and just to the general idea that like you know, a state for the French, a state for the Germans, a state for the Poles and so on. Like the Jews don't fit into any of those. So like there's, there's very real problems of antisemitism and, and uh, being excluded from these nationalist projects and being scapegoated in this way uh, that contributes to Zionism. But Zionism is also just one of the possible, one of the potential solutions that Jews are coming up with for these problems. There's also uh, and and it, that's kind of, I would say, the most right-wing solution. There's also um, various other groups that are seeking national cultural autonomy, like the Bund. There's uh, communists and anarchists who are seeing liberation from anti-Semitism in the abolition of capitalism and, you know, the end of bourgeois, um, you know, national chauvinism and things like that. Um, the Soviet Union, after it's established in 1922, uh, begins to discuss, you know, forming um, ethnic states for Jews per, uh, first in Crimea. Eventually, they wind up setting it up in uh, the Amur Valley in the Soviet Far East in uh, Birabidjan. So those are kinds of things that are also swirling. There's also um, an assimilationist attitude, kind of really going almost all the way back to the beginnings of the reform Jewish movement in the 18th and 19th centuries of just saying, like, look, just forget about it. Just become Germans, just become, you know, French, whatever. Um, and that's more possible in Western Europe than it is in Eastern Europe for, for various reasons. But suffice to say, there's kind of a, a gradual, you know, all these different strategies out there for what was basically called the Jewish question, right? So Zionism arises out of, out of, out of that. And really until, until the Shoah is really not the majority opinion of most Jews in Europe. Um, it, it's really the, the events of the Holocaust that really kind of create the conditions in which Zionism could become the, uh, the, the dominant force uh, among European Jews. And that's mostly because two thirds of European Jews had been killed by 1945. So, um, the, and I think maybe let's just kind of stop there for a second and regroup yeah. and just kind of say that's a little bit of how we get to this point of um, this thing called Zionism existing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I think one of the questions I have about that, just to kind of follow up a little bit, is in that process of sort of creating this, 
what you termed like sort of the most right wing kind of answer to this question of, you know, how does Judaism, how do Jewish people fit within this? Um, you know, and, and I appreciate you laying out like that, that, that period, people need to understand like nation states become this new thing. And, you know, nations, I think in your conversation with Sina Rachmani on the East of is a podcast, use the example of like uh, the Czechoslovakia, right? Czechs, you know, Czech, the Czech people and like this idea of like, it becomes a weird kind of puzzle almost of in within Europe. And it's always a, um, a very fraught, I guess, and um, complicated process nationalisms, just generally, especially bourgeois nationalisms in particular, we're talking about here. Um, and so I'm also interested a little bit because there is this thing that happens with Zionists in particular, where they will, you know, go back to all these sort of use historical examples or pull up biblical examples or pull up, uh, you know, examples from, I guess, the Torah, right, or whatever. And like, um, could you say a little bit about like that, that process? Because I think it is something that people confront when talking about um, Israel, Palestine, in particular, like, sort of folks who say like, well, it's our historic homeland, you know, yeah, just say a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, um, you're absolutely right that there is this uh, kind of attempt to like make up a, a history of of um, of Judaism that kind of presents Zionism as like the eternal dream. Like ever since ever since the destruction of the of the Second Temple or or you know bar kokhba whatever you want to kind of point to as like the defining point where like the diaspora begins which i think that that's a fraught concept anyway um so suffice to say as a historian it, it pisses me off when um when when people kind of try to talk about that like just just to make the point i just want to point out but i'm not going to i'm not going to dwell on this by the time of the jewish roman wars there was already more jews living outside of judea than there were inside of it so when the diaspora began is up to you. Suffice to say, this idea that like returning to, you know, Eretz Israel, as the as the Zionists say, the land of Israel, um, is like this 2000 year dream of the Jewish people. And it's all we think about every year, right? At the end of the Passover Seder, we say, next year in Jerusalem. And this was proof that we actually were dreaming next year, we want to be like in the city of David doing this, you know, doing this stuff. And like, that's not true. Like there, you know, there's, there's, there's very particular meanings that phrases like that have where, um, I mean, just to, just to kind of dwell on this, this example for a second, because it is a very common one, like, oh, well, Jews, they say next year in Jerusalem, they've clearly always wanted to go back to Jerusalem, you know? So, um, this is it, 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 this expression is, is discussed in the Talmud, which is a, a collection of commentaries on the Torah that is kind of forms the basis of Jewish law, halacha. And um, it was written down first, second, third centuries, um, mostly in like southern Syria and Babylon, which was kind of the center of Judaism for a while after the destruction of the temple. Um, so the, the point they make is basically that like, when we say this, we're not talking about literally going back to the earthly Jerusalem. We're talking about a heavenly Jerusalem. So, you know, uh, 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 so it's, it, it, you know, it's really in the same way. If you think about like, like William Blake's poem, right, where he, where he talks about like, we will build our Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land, right? Like, he's not saying we're going to build a replica of the Damascus Gate on Salisbury Plain. He's talking about like the spiritual renewal of England and the fits of the industrial revolution. And he sees that as a spiritual corruption of the country and stuff. And so like, he's talking about like a, a, a heavenly Jerusalem. And that's kind of what, what, what that, what that expression means, you know, in the context of Judaism over the last 1900, the last 2000 years saying that expression. So, but Zionists use that kind of thing. And there are many other examples too, of kind of using that to try and say, well, this has always been the goal. When in reality, like I said, Zionism wasn't even the attitude of the majority of, I don't, I don't even know if it was ever the attitude of the majority of Jews, but certainly the majority of European Jews so, uh, became a dominant current um, in the middle of the 20th century. So that's, you know, and and and, and there, there's, especially after Israel is established in 1948, 
there is a great deal of effort put into saying, identifying like a one-to-one equation of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And, you know, um, I think about, I want to say it was maybe 2016 or so, I think, um, Joy Reid had Netanyahu on MSNBC and referred to him as the leader of the Jewish people, you know, like, um, which is, which, which is crazy, but like, that is kind of a popular, I know you kind of mentioned that, like, you kind of wanted to address that, that kind of misconception a little bit, you know, and maybe, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead a little. No, no, not <laughs> at all. Topic, no, I mean, but... it, we don't have to, yeah, I mean, I know, yeah, not at all. I mean, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think it's important for us to kind of, and I know we'll get to it more as we go through this, but it is it is that conflation that I think is really uh, is really violent. And um, I mean, in this specific moment, we're also seeing a lot of, you know, and I feel like it's a generational thing to some degree, but we're also seeing a lot of younger people, uh, younger Jews in particular, say, you know, no, like you're not doing this in my name. You know, this is not. This is not what Judaism is about. Stop conflating um, our religion, our belief system with your settler colonial project and the kind of uh, fascist and you know genocidal aims that are kind of ongoing in this specific moment, you know. And so I think we'll get to that a little bit more a little later, but I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I'm seeing again, um, it, com- it comes up in conversations with especially older folks I know, I, I'll throw my parents in here too, who are like sympathetic to Palestinians. And, um, it, but also, you know, they do have Jewish friends, though some of them may be Zionist or maybe, you know, feel some relationship to Israel, right? And like, one of the things that gets pointed out and, and brought up is this, is this period of, of course, you have the Holocaust, right? Which occurs in the early, you know, start, I guess it, you know, 38 to, you know, I don't know the exact years, but basically I think 42 through 45 is like the most intense, you know, portion of it. Um, Obviously it was always kind of um, a part of the Nazi agenda, right. Was to, was to deal with the, the Jewish problem within their society in a genocidal way. Right. And um, so you have this, right. And then not very long after it, of course you have, this period of 47, 48, where you get um, the kind of UN plan, which was not, as I understand it, like agreed to by Palestinians. Um, You have then 48, which we get to the Nakba, which then now we're talking about another genocide. Um, And that, which is much less well known. I mean, I think a lot of our audience knows about it, but I don't think that it carries at all... um, you know, I, I'm not trying to equate atrocities or anything like that, but it, but I don't think that it has like the kind of um, register in our memory that it should as 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 the event that it was. Um, so, you know, part of this idea is that Israel was established in sort of 47, 48 due to the anti-Semitism that existed in Europe, due to the genocide that was occurred in the Holocaust. And, you know, we we strongly associate these things together. And I know that aspects of this narrative are, you know, there's historical basis. Like we we just laid out the time period like um, but I'm curious if you could talk about what are some of the like incomplete aspects of that story or the problematic elements of that narrative? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the, the, the period of the formation of Israel and kind of like when people want to blame the Palestinians for what happened to them, this is kind of the period that they point to, right? And so I I think the best way to go about this is to kind of address head on, first, the things that are true about this narrative, all right? The Holocaust did happen. And, um, you know, between 5.5 and 6 million uh, European Jews, um, some from North Africa too, um, were, were murdered. Um, it's about two thirds of European Jewry, and uh, and it wasn't just by the Germans; that was orchestrated by the Nazis in their empire. Um, but they had collaborators in every country, and uh, and it, you know it built on centuries of anti-Semitism that took many different forms, and and all that is true. 
And so after after the Red Army, you know, did the majority of the smashing of the German uh, Nazi army, um, you know, that those attitudes didn't just disappear overnight. Those people who had, you know, participated in the Holocaust, a lot, not all of them got shot in Nuremberg. A lot of them went home. And um, and so if let, let's think about like the liberation of the camps of the concentration camps, you have, you know, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people really who were in the camps who survived um, and are kind of kept in dis displaced persons camps, or I forget the exact term they use for several years after the last dis displaced persons camp, I think it was disbanded in 1952. So, um, and, and a lot of the other conditions that had allowed so many European Jews to get killed, um, such as um, Western governments, the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, and so on, um, refusing to take um, Jewish refugees. Um, those rules stayed. And so they didn't want any more Jews in the country after World War II than they did before. Uh, especially, you know, poor ones who are coming with nothing that they're going to have to feed and whatever and whatever. Um, so, and again, a lot of that is also anti-Semitism too. The U.S. State Department in, in the 1940s is rife and run through with vicious anti-Semites. Um, so it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious problem. Uh, and so, you know, these do create the conditions in which about 250,000 to 300,000 or so of these uh, survivors of the Shoah are funneled into um, the British mandate in Palestine. Um, now, by the 40s, a lot of a lot of what was going down in Palestine was already like the ground was already prepared. You've already had one, two, three, four Arab revolts by this point um, against um, the growing Jewish encroachment um, in Palestine, which is working with the British mandate authorities. Um, they're establishing, already establishing kind of exclusive communities. Um, they're setting themselves up. Typically the way that this worked, the, the, to kind of give a very brief history of this, um, Zionist organizations raised money, often in the United States, but in Europe, um, used that money to buy land, estates usually from absentee landlords and Ottoman landlords, and then afterwards people own the land, and then they set themselves up as the new landlords, you know, and they're the people who worked the land under them were Arab fellahin. Uh, and so the, this is, and, and the Jewish national fund is one of the biggest organizations of this by the, by the time of the Nakba, the Jewish national fund owns, I think like more than half of all the land that Jews live on in Palestine. Uh, so enormous, enormous organization that the JNF also heads up the formation of what's called, um, what did they call them? Transfer committee, the transfer committee transfer was a 1940s, um, euphemism for, um, displacement for ethnic cleansing. And so, um, 48 comes and you have everyone, I think what people know, your the listeners probably know about the massacres by the Ergun and the, and the Haganah at Der Yassin and at uh, Lida and places like that, you know, uh, Haifa, where there was, you know, driving these massacres of Palestinian villages to intimidate others to, to flee the country. This is this is the the, the practical, you know, carrying out of the Nakba. Um, and so the transfer committees uh, organize basically, they basically organize these and also then make sure afterwards that these people who fled from the war aren't able to come back afterwards. So this is all kind of this, this nefarious system that, the, that was set in motion at least by the 19, early 1930s um, in, in Palestine. So those ref, Holocaust refugees get funneled into this system that is already existing. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so, so, so that 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 there there are a lot of elements of truth to this and whatever. I think where the myth comes in is on the one hand the idea that like um, this was kind of the final hope of the Jewish people, um, right? And 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 this is something that is so driven into like the the, the Jewish the, the 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 Israeli national anthem is Hatikva, the hope. Um, you know, and, and if you read the lyrics, it's a very moving 
poem about like this is this is our final chance to escape. It's it's pure it's pure you know ideology um, in that as any national anthem is I assume um, you know what I mean. It is a bourgeois right. It is a nationalist. <laughs> so um, it 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 is very laden in that kind of thing. So there's that aspect, and like I said, there there are elements of truth to it. Um, while also keeping in mind that, you know, many Jews did go to the United States. If you look at, for example, European immigration, like uh, in the first half of the 20th century, I want to say like 200,000 or so go to Palestine, 2.3 million go to the United States, um, Jews from Eastern Europe. So it's, it's, and, and there's also a lot of, you know, a lot of Latin American governments have large Jewish populations now because in the forties, the Americans uh, pressured them into taking in the Jewish refugees too. So um, there's that, there's also that kind of um, thing too, but suffice to say, there are a lot of these Jews who get sent there and it's really romanticized also. I think ever I think you may or may not know this film based on a book called Exodus um, which is a very, very romanticized version of like these displaced persons taking over a kind of rundown ship that they, you know, then kind of barely float their way across the Mediterranean to land in Israel and start a new life and whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's a very kind of um, manifest destiny kind of energy to it, you know? So there's all of that uh, surrounding, you know, the 45 to 48 period. Um, and, and, there's, then there's also the myths surrounding the Nakba and the events of 1948 um, that all basically all kind of seek to blame the Palestinians one way or another for what happened to them, for being driven off the land, not being allowed to return, et cetera, et cetera. And these have to do with everything from, well, they were, you know, expected to return at the head of a victorious Arab army. And so they all left and, you know, by their own volition, basically, because they hated Jews so much, you know, and, and the massacres of Der Yassin and, and, and Lida and so on, you know, which, which were deliberate way spreading of fear, you know, um, is, um, uh, is an enormous part of this, you know, these are just villagers, you know, and, and small towns. There's a really great film that was made a couple of years ago called Farha, which tells the tale of one girl in one small town um, and, and her experience of the Nakba. And um, it really kind of makes clear, like a lot of these towns, these are just little villages, you know, they don't have the capacity to really defend themselves very much. And, um, you know, as has happened through most of human history and is happening now, if you watch the, you know, the way that wars are happening in places like Ukraine, where people are able to flee, when the, when the soldiers come in or ahead of the soldiers coming in, you hear the guns firing in the distance, you leave because your town is about to become a battlefield. Like that's just what you do. That's, that's, that's what happens when a war comes, uh, war is terrible and that's a consequence of war. So the, 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 the idea that, that, that the Palestinians are like to blame is, is, is a big part of this, of the, of this myth. And, and also like, oh, like you said, like they weren't consulted in this partition plan. Um, but yet they are some, they somehow rejected it. And, um, and, you know, it's like, oh, well, if they had just made the deal with the Jews, then with then with the, with the emergent Israeli government, then they would have gotten everything that they wanted. Right. This is the, every time there's a negotiation. It's always if they had just, you know, just, you know, swallowed their pride, then they and, and, and their anti-Semitism, then they would have gotten what they wanted. But like we know from uh, as I talked about, there were these transfer committees that formed that were dedicated already dedicated to the idea of driving Palestinians off the land, whether they resisted or not. You know, David Ben-Gurion, who becomes the first prime minister of Israel, who's the head of the World Zionist Organization uh, before the war, um, he talks about the necessity of transfers and how if the Arabs won't accept Jewish rule, they're going to have to accelerate the transfers and force these people off the land. So this was the plan one way or another, you know, there's no way that it could have unfolded that the Palestinians would have not been blamed for for the ethnic cleansing of them from from their land. So um, I don't know how well that answers your question. <laughs> no, that's that's helpful. And I think it also you, you know, you brought up a couple of things that obviously have a lot of resonance to, to this particular moment. I think one of the um, you know, one of the concerns I hear, I mean, one, this idea of Palestinians being blamed for their own, you know, for their own removal, for their own deaths, right? Like we are seeing this uh, actively play out every day right now where 
you know, because of the Palestinian resistance and, um, you know, the level that it has been able to achieve now, you know, Israel is is bombing civilians and, you know, openly threatening genocidal uh, framings, you know, basically, you know, saying we will remove you or we'll kill you all and, you know, talking about their children and everything and and is doing it in such a way of, I mean, it's it's textbook collective punishment, right, from a sort of, uh, you know, international law frame, you know. Um, and then in addition to that, this idea, too, of, you know, one of the things I hear most prominently from Palestinians is that they don't want to leave Gaza, right? They don't want to be, you know, sent into Egypt in tent cities. Um, I'm sure some would go at this point because of how dire things are in Gaza right now, because there's no no water, no fuel, no electricity, their hospitals, everything's being bombed. But they don't want to because it is the land that they that they have. Right. And they're not, they're afraid that if they they leave that they they haven't a right of return has been something that has been an issue for them since the beginning. Um, maybe that would be useful, too, to break down to people like what is the right of return the Palestinians do seek, but also thinking about those those framings of, you know, forced removal being blamed for, uh, you know, your own deaths or your own removal and um, this this precedent of not being able to return um, after subsequent, um, you know, wars and uh land grabs essentially right by israel yeah yeah I, I and i think that the parallels between the 1948 nakba and what's going on now and i mean obviously you know palestinians make the make the point that like the nakba never ended you know palestinians are still being driven off their land um in israel and um you know in the negev uh in northern israel in the golan in uh in the west bank in east jerusalem uh, and, you know, in Gaza. And I think, I think it's really useful to remit, to recall that there is one place where, um, the Palestinians succeeded at convincing, at forcing the Israelis to pull their own settlers out. And that's Gaza. All right. In 2005, five years into the second intifada, the Israelis agreed to withdraw from the Gaza Strip completely and remove 8,000 Jewish settlers from there. Every single Jewish settler in Gaza was removed and, and Gaza was returned to Palestinian control. Only time that's ever happened. And they've never stopped punishing the Palestinians in Gaza for that ever since. And I see what's happening now as... Um, just the latest act in an attempt to get revenge in an attempt to crush you know the the any type of palestinian sovereignty uh at all and uh, we've seen what a joke they've made of it in the uh de facto bantu stands of the west bank uh which the palestinian authority has basically collaborated in the creation of you know the policing of i think about i think last year or so Blinken went and he met with, a. it was even earlier this year, I'm sorry, earlier this year, when there was the raids in Janin and Nablus and stuff against these, um, these kind of new militant groups that were forming there. And they formed there because the, 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 the PA just doesn't have any authority anymore. You know, Blinken went to um, Abbas's people in I think March, maybe, or February, earlier this year, and basically told them, you have to go take a reestablished control in Nablus, um, you know, or there's going to be a third intifada. And um, Abbas's people had to basically say, we don't have any authority in Nablus. We can't roll in there, you know, and act like we run the place anymore. It's because nobody trusts them and believes in them. And you know, I mean, whatever you say, whatever you want to say and criticize Hamas or whatever, but like, they're the ones who have actually like continued to lead a resistance state of sorts uh, in Gaza. And, and the Israelis are, yeah, they're terrified of that, but they hate that. Like, this is what they've been trying to prevent. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a very real, you know, desire to crush that and to humiliate them and yeah, to drive them off of 
off of the land. I mean, if the if the Israeli proposal or or I should say ultimatum, you know, uh, is is actually carried out, it won't even be the Gaza Strip anymore. Gaza City is one of the places to be evacuated, you know, and and yeah, it makes sense that a lot of people are going to stay there because. I want to say like more than a third of the population of the Gaza Strip are themselves refugees from nearby cities, places like places like Lydda, places like um, Ashkelon and Ashdod, you know, where they were driven out of and they were forced to go down there and and settle, you know, in Gaza where there was an, a, a degree of, you know, Palestinian community that remained. Um, you'll recall that after uh, between 1948 and 1967, the Gaza Strip was part of Egypt. Um, the Egyptians seized that just as the Jordanians controlled the West Bank. And uh, Israel seized both of those territories, along with East Jerusalem, the entire Sinai, and the Golan, from those countries, plus Syria, in 1967. And that's how that, that's why that kind of weird delineation of that territory exists and why there remained Palestinians who were, who were there. Um, so, Yeah. I no, think that great. I've kind of lost track of what I was getting at, um, but I think I've made my point. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, so I want to get into some of your some of your recent work a little bit. Um, you know, you wrote a piece, um, you know, that that discusses um, more recent far right attempts to silence Palestinian activists in the U.S., but also you explore attempts to silence and marginalize Jewish criticism of Israel or to make anti-Zionist Jews seem like bad Jews or fake Jews uh, or not really Jewish. This is something you examine in a piece of yours, um, you know, on that I mentioned at the top on the dangerous con convergence of religious nationalism in Israel and America. And so um, one, I would love if you would just talk a little bit about what you're what you're laying out in your argument in that piece and, and describing. And also if, you know, if this moment also kind of brings to a head some of the things that you're that you're discussing there. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, this I, this, I read this article earlier this year. Um, I think I actually wrote it in like March or so. Um, and then it was printed over the summer um, in um, Fellowship magazine. Um, but the the kind of initiator of this article was um, some shifts that were happening in Israel, um, kind of as the immediate fallout of the November 2022 elections, um, which you'll remember the far right one, the far, far right one, much further than Likud. Likud's far right enough. But um, you have, you know, uh, Otzma Yehudit and um, um, the religious Zionist party led, led by Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bazal el Smotrich, these men who were fascists. Give, give you an idea of how much of a fascist these guys are. Um, the, these, their political ideology is described as kahanas, and these men are followers of a rat, of an extremely radical right-wing uh, rabbi named Mir Kahan, whose followers were responsible for assassinating Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin um, for signing the Oslo Accords and ending the First Intifada. You know, so that's how extremely racist, anti-Arab, uh, anti-Palestinian, and I should add anti-women, anti-queer, you know, anti-democratic people, these people are. And um, Netanyahu, who's already, like I said, kind of a right-wing terror enough, you know, formed a coalition with these people uh, and they use their kind of points of leverage in, in this coalition to really get some very, very lucrative posts in the justice um, and uh, 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 ministry control over West Bank police and things like that were really chance to push their their really hateful um, agenda. And the most recent, of course, is Ben Gvir um, arming, sending tens of thousands of rifles to West Bank settlers in the last two weeks. Um, which has led to new pogroms against Palestinians there. So, um, to, sorry, to get back on track, um, <laughs> the, the, the article describes a couple of trends um, that are related to what, it, when we started the program, I said there were two different types of Zionism, Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism. And um, the ways that, uh, support for Israel has become a political litmus test for um, Republicans, especially in the United States, 
and um, such that they then posture as kind of like the biggest defenders and supporters of Israel. And if you look at kind of the comments that politicians have made in this uh, in the last couple of weeks, you can really see how that has played out. Everyone's posturing in that way right up to Joe Biden, you know. When Joe Biden was a senator, he said that Israel, if if Israel didn't exist, we would have to invent it, right? Kind of parroting, uh, paraphrasing Voltaire a little bit there. Um, so you know, I mean, he's this he he is he is definitely one of these one of these uh, people. I know he's a Catholic, but he is still very much you know a Zionist and, and a believer in that. So there is this convergence between that right wing politics and a politics of um, right wing, very pro Zionist uh, Jews, the, the Ben Shapiro's of the world, the Josh hammers of the world and so on, who are happy to team up with these um, fellow Republicans, these fellow right wing people um, to try and silence critics of Israel, especially Jewish, Jewish critics of Israel. Um, and so the, the article kind of takes apart some of those dynamics and the ways that not just that there is this demonization of like, you know, liberal Jews, progressive Jews, anti-Zionist Jews are bad Jews, quote unquote, um, or, or, you know, not serious Jews or whatever, um, because they don't put the, you know, defending Israel at the top of their agenda, um, but also that the clearly the government in Israel itself is feeling this kind of pressure um, and is putting pressure on right wingers in the United States to silence these people as well. And you can see that in the ways that the Netanyahu's government has discussed changing um, the ways that the law of return works um, to not recognize so many um, converts to Judaism or um, you know, Jews that have um, a lesser amount of like kind of Jewish, you know, bloodline um, than like, you know, to, you know, Jewish parents or, or, or anything like that. These were rules that were relaxed in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s to allow a, a, an influx of new um, Jewish um citizens into into Israel to kind of buttress their rank after they took over the West Bank and Gaza and stuff they were there was kind of a they had kind of a demographic crisis for lack of a better term where they didn't basically didn't have enough Jews to justify controlling the land and so they needed to bring in more people and so they relaxed the rules and what they considered to be a Jew um it happened again in the 90s after the end of the after the Soviet Union was dissolved and a lot of the refuseniks were now able to emigrate and so they said well and most of these people were secular most of these people you know were very heavily assimilated had maybe one Jewish grandparent or whatever but still kind of thought of themselves as Jews and so you know they had to change their their very strict rules in Israel again to allow these people to come in um so it's um they've played this game back and forth of like, you know, who's a Jew. And now they're trying to restrict it again because um, they, in particular, in a way that kind of goes after converts to reform Judaism uh, or, you know, Jews that don't necessarily have the the kind of, you know, tightest um, Jewish bloodline. Uh, and, and all of that is to control who, you know, who who's a critic, who is considered to be represented by the Israeli state. Um, very interestingly, over the years, people have tried to argue that they have an Israeli nationality, um, that they're citizens of Israel, that that's their nationality, Israel. And the, the Israeli courts have time and again iterated, there's no such thing as an Israeli nationality. If you have citizenship in Israel, you have a Jewish nationality because you're a Jew. But there's no such thing as an Israeli nationality. And they do that because if there was an Israeli nationality, then it wouldn't matter if you were Jewish or if you were Palestinian or, or Muslim or Christian or whatever, you know, the case may be, Druze, you know, and somebody else who lives, if you live in Israel, then it becomes a, a state of all the people, right? You know, um, rather than an ethno state that exists for the Jews and for nobody else, which is what it is and what it maintains and defends. So, so that's kind of why that question matters. And then there's also this issue, as I said, of controlling the diaspora, where um, if you look at the statistics, the younger generations of Jews are becoming increasingly critical of Israel and its policies. They're more likely to consider Israel to be an apartheid state, more likely to call Israel racist, say that it's committing genocide against Palestinians. Um, and some of these numbers can be 25, 30, 40 percent uh, of some of these you know, demographic age groups. So it's, it's a serious concern for them. And that's why the um, 
Israeli state in looking for Americans to secure American support for Israel have increasingly leaned on these right-wing Christian Zionists uh, to be their basis of support. So, so that's kind of what explains this kind of vast swirling dynamic of um, right-wing politics, uh, all in defense of, of um, what, uh, I can't remember which one, some American Secretary of State referred to Israel one time as the biggest unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Middle East. Um, so that's kind of what this is all in defense of, you know? Yeah, well, thank you for breaking that down. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, and and if folks have questions in the chat, feel free to to drop them in, and maybe we'll try to do a little bit of Q and A after this. This is the last question that I had tonight, which is just, you know, this is a really we're in a really critical moment in history, and we're watching you know atrocities unfold on a daily basis, um, you know, and and should say, of course. The U.S. is fully supporting Israel in just doing whatever it wants, essentially. Um, with, it basically has a blank check. It's sending, you know, unlimited weaponry and, you know, and all of that. So knowing that and looking at this struggle, you know, we're, we're here in Empire. We're in the United States. Um, and knowing, knowing our complicity and our role in what's going on there. Um, you know, I'm curious if you think that there is a specific role that anti-Zionist Jews need to sort of play within that struggle. And, and you know, I'm, I'm asking that because I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, I think all of us have a responsibility and all of us need to play a role. So I don't want to in any way suggest that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more on anti-Zionist Jews than it is on, you know, wasps or like whatever else right it, it, but but i because i think we all have a, a responsibility here but maybe there's a role that they can play in particular because of the way that judaism gets used as a kind of um shield or um uh, i don't know the way that these two things are kind of um, mystified their relationship together i don't know if you have thoughts on that yeah i mean i think i think that there is a unique role for anti-Zionist Jews to play, I don't think that it's a more important role. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it is it is the the pretty obvious one of standing up and saying not in our name, you know, and and you know taking the lead in well one I guess doing things like I'm doing tonight, you know, um, coming out here and and you know discussing the myths and you know disproving the Hasbara and uh, and you know kind of tackling their ideology from the inside. You know, as Jews, we we have an insider perspective on these things, you know, and we can kind of undermine some of those uh, some of those myths. But um, I think, you know, the most important thing is uh, to do is, as, as you said, something that you can do irrespective of ethnicity or religion or whatever. And that is to show up. That is to that is to def stand up for stand stand in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. It is to, you know, challenge the lies. It is to hold people accountable when they lie. It is to go after the people, you know, in power. I love the protests outside of like Elbit systems and things, you know. I think that that's great. But I mean, it's also it's also marching, you know, in force um, in, in, in your city. I really love how in, in the past, the, the, there has been such an incredible outpouring of support um for for the palestinian struggle in the last two weeks since since you know this horrible violence latest round of violence has begun um and yeah so it, it's it's you know th times are things are changing and i think that it's important for for jews to show up you know for those struggles and to you know undertake the effort to deprogram from the zionist indoctrination you know that you're subjected to uh, and to, you know, have those conversations with your Jewish family and your Jewish friends and, you know, and, and, and to do that. But it's also, you know, that, like I said, that's just kind of a unique role. I don't think that that's an exceptional role. Um, uh, in yeah, right that. I don't think, we, I don't think we have a larger or a smaller role than anybody else to play in that. That's just kind of, because we're Jews, that's what we have to do. 
Um, but everybody has to show up. Everybody has to challenge Zionism. Everybody has to, you know, make those links of solidarity between our struggle and theirs. And, you know, to be willing to see the fight through to the end and to understand the ways that, you know, the, our, the, the Israeli state and its supporters, which includes the U.S. government and its supporters, are going to demonize uh, and the the Palestinian resistance and anybody who sympathizes with the Palestinian resistance. And we have to understand how to reject that and challenge that and not be intimidated by that and keep doing what's right and what's necessary, you know, um, until final victory. Right on. Um, you mentioned something just while you're, well, we still have you, you brought up uh, the term uh, Hasbara and, you know, I have, I think, a fairly good idea of what this is, but I also recognize, I think some people don't know what this term means. I mean, I know it doesn't have like a, I guess it doesn't have like a one-to-one -one translation really into English, but, um, but could you just say a little bit about what that is? Because I think we are also like one of the things that we're seeing right now is a, uh, a constant creation of misinformation and disinformation also by the Israeli state amid this struggle. And um, a lot of times people use that term to describe it, but, you know, I, I wonder if you could just share a little bit about that. Yeah, has Hasbara basically, I guess the best way to translate it is explaining. Um, it is, it's basically PR for the Israeli state. Um, it, is a, it is the kind of spin operation um, that they have a very conscious, you know, and, 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 and directed effort towards um, generating basically pro-Israel or, or uh, you know, explanations that are, vin you know, vindicate Israeli actions, Israeli policies and whatever. Um, I think I think a good example that everyone's familiar with tonight is the ways that we've seen just over the course of a couple of hours. How many times has the official narrative about what happened to the Baptist Hospital in Gaza City changed? First, it was we bombed this place because it was full of terrorists. Then it was well, we actually don't know what happened. Then it was made. Then it was well, it was a Hamas rocket that actually fell. You know. Then it was we're deleting the tweet, and and kind of this narrative management. And um, we're all familiar with narrative management and the ways that you know the the PR parts of governments and especially especially in the media, you know, frame and shape and give the. Um, and, 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 you know, create uh, excuses for the terrible things that our governments do. Um, it's just kind of elevated to a higher art form, I guess, with the Israelis, just because they are so self-conscious of their need to maintain good graces um, with, above all, with, as I said, their supporters in the United States. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I think the thing is people will talk about Hasbara and the context of a kind of like tail wags the dog type of thing. The idea that like Israel or Israelis or Jews actually control American foreign policy. And I think that that is really a very mistaken way of looking at things. Um, you know, this is, it is, it is really, it's PR for a Western colony. Um, and, and Israel, Israel is, it does what it does because it's allowed to do it. Um, because the, it's useful. And even in the kind of, I guess you could say chaos energy that Israel, you know, puts off bombing all of its neighbors and, you know, implementing these horrible laws and everything is also kind of, it's kind of useful in a way, um, to, to American policy. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, their willingness to carry out, um, terrorist attacks, assassinations of, you know, Ar Iran's nuclear program or things like that, or before that, Pakistan's nuclear program. Um, I don't know if people know about this. The, the Israelis blew up a factory in France that was building parts for a nuclear power plant in Pakistan in the 80s. Um, things like that, you know, um, that, that the U.S. would love to do, um, but it has somebody else to do it for them, you know, and so... Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just kind of want to end on that note. I, I appreciate that. And I mean, I think that, um, it's really important at this time too, that we not, um, that, the, that, that the, that our righteous 
anger at what's going on and at you know the zionist state of israel and these policies that we again like you said not envision it as the tail wagging the dog not look at it as just um you know understanding that israel plays a specific role for the u.s and western europe um you know and that it has a strategic role um and and as you laid out it it has it has it can it can do things right because it's kind of allowed to do things by the west and also not um not turn to anti-semitism you know because it because there is this by conflating by israel's project i think and the u.s adopting this as well of conflating jewishness with zionism with israel right in, in such clear terms where you know criticism of Israel is deemed anti-Semitic, right? Is probably the easiest discussion that we could have, right? Um, I think there is a real danger too that in this you actually stoke both, you know, which we should be very concerned about, and because it's it's real, anti-Palestinian and anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiments and racism and attacks that will go on here in this country, but also anti-Semitism, right? Because these things are not uh, because they're so mystified within kind of mainstream news and stuff like that. And and within how our, even our government talks about these things or my kids' school districts, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add on that, but I did appreciate you you clarifying that point. Yeah, I you know, I think about this sometimes because, you know, I mean, I have Palestinian friends, I have Muslim friends, and, and you know, the... the there's there's no there's no daylight between us you know like the the if it wasn't for the issue of palestine um i you know uh i think that that the american jewish and american muslim communities would be very close um because as you said we have the same enemies here you know white supremacists neo nazis they want to kill both of us you know, they're coming after both of us. They're playing the blame, you know, the blame game, the manipulation game of you should be afraid of so and so, you you know, such and such hates you kind of thing. And there is obviously a connection between U.S. foreign policy abroad and the way that it manages dissent and, you know, the, the working class here at home to keep people disunited in various ways. Um, and and I, I don't doubt the utility of that. But, you know, like if you remove the question of Zionism, um, you know, from the equation, uh, and, and, and Israel from the equation, then the, there's, there's really not a lot of daylight between these communities. Um, so, uh, I, I think that that's, that's an important thing, you know, for, for Jews to realize, um, because there's, well, there's an element of racial solidarity too, and that especially like white Ashkenazi Jews and you know some white Sephardi Jews are basically included in whiteness in the United States. And obviously, there is a even if you are a, a light skinned Muslim, there is a racialization of Muslims, you know, uh, in the United States and of Arabs and all that too. So there's an element of just the kind of typical, you know, we have to fight racism and the ways that we fight that and build solidarity here in the U.S. working class. Um, but there is also um, I think especially, and I brought up this term Jewish safety because that's always the thing that comes up with Israel, right? Is that Israel is necessary for Jewish safety, right? But the thing that we know is that Israel doesn't keep Jews safe. Israel makes the world more dangerous for Jews. And, um, and so, you know, if we want to talk about what keeps Jew American Jews safe, um, it's fighting white supremacy, you know? It's fighting... It's teaming up with people who have the same enemies as us, which is going to be Palestinian Americans, it's going to be Muslims, it's going to be Arabs, you know, in the U.S. and 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 fighting in that way, you know. So that's what enhances Jewish safety. You know, it's not it's not Palestine. Like after after the 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 attacks on the border towns, right? Um, two weeks ago. There was the, all this a big show about we're going to enhance safety and security around um, synagogues in the United States and stuff like that. And like I made a point at that time um, that like it's not Palestinians, it's not Hamas isn't going after American synagogues. It's white supremacists. It's neo Nazis are the ones who are the dangers to American Jews. And so like there's uh, 
the only reason that and that any American Jews think that Palestinians or Arabs are their enemies is because of this identification with the Israeli state that's been forced upon them. And so the way that we really become safe and and forge those bonds of solidarity within our own working class here is to reject this identification and identity with Israel and to say that like this is this is what we have to do to be safe and it has nothing to do with that. Very much appreciated. Morgan uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming through on short notice and breaking all of this down for us. Um, I'm going to let you go. I, yeah, just much appreciated. And uh, thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right, folks. So that will conclude this episode of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Um, make sure you like the video, share it. Um, especially with folks you study with and um, struggle with. And uh, of course, you know, sign up, support us on Patreon. Um, and we will be reconvening on Thursday. We will have a discussion with two organizers from Decolonized Palestine uh, that we'll be calling in from Ramallah. So uh, definitely tune in for that. I think it's going to be at 10 a.m. I just need to confirm a couple details, but the link should be up um, either this evening or tomorrow. So anyways, uh, look forward to seeing you then. And thanks again to our guests, Morgan Artukina. <laughs>